unapologetic, unadulterated, and uncompromising. Greetings, brothers and sisters from around the world, and welcome back to the home, the haven, the stronghold, and the super fortress of intelligent black thought. This is the BlackChannel.net radio. I am, of course, your host, your brother, your humble servant, Mr. Jason Black, the Black Authority. And we're glad to have you all back with us here this evening again for another broadcast of the BlackChannel.net radio program. And uh, what a broadcast we do have available for you tonight because tonight is a worldwide universal teaching moment because I hope that everybody's learned a lot from the events that have transpired in the last few days I hope that you've learned a lot from it and I hope that we learn a lot more as we go along here tonight now right now what we're discussing here and we don't do topics here on the black channel per se but we do talk about what's on my mind at the time and what is on my mind is that now here I am and I'm just perusing online. I don't go to a whole bunch of places, but I do try to keep my ear to the street. I do try to find out what people are talking about. And when I see some type of major movement, if I do see people who are speaking against the interests of black people, then of course, of course, I'm going to take notice of that. Of course, I'm going to stand up and say something about that when I see that that kind of behavior occur. Now, I had gotten up here a few days ago and I had seen that a number of people were posting, or should I say reposting, sharing an article from the unscrupulous online white supremacist mouthpiece website the root now you've got hard white supremacy you have soft white supremacy you've got individuals and then you've got the other side of it there's a wing within the soft white supremacist movement and what they do is they co-opt willing collaborators that's their job and the root is set up as a mouthpiece for the soft white supremacists to pr promote a white supremacist racist agenda by using the tried and true tactic of warfare of when you go to war against a group of people you can pay off there's always going to be a certain number of those people that you can pay off to fight against their own people and that is what constitutes the employees and the writers at The Root and The Griot and Madame Noir and Clutch and a bunch of other places. But that's who they employ there. That's what they do. That's what you got to do to get a job at one of those places. That's the kind of person that you have to be if you want to work there. And this week they were plying their trade, of course. Now, there was a female named Yisha I think that's the way it's said isn't it and what she did was she went about the work of saying well what I'm going to do is I am going to see if I can help my buddies out and see if I can get them if I can help promote a false story. The comedian Chris Rock had stated that he had been pulled over by the police yet again. He had been pulled over yet again. And he had posted up that, you know, this is like his third time in two months getting pulled over in basically the same area. And... People are wondering, well, what in the world is going on here? What in the world is happening? Why is this man getting pulled over 
repeatedly all these times. Why is that occurring? And the actor Isaiah Washington went on Twitter and was like, hey, maybe Chris should trade in the Mercedes for a Prius. A little car. Something a lot less assuming. And then he just put up the put up adapt at Chris Rock. And that was when the white supremacist shills and lackeys and flunkies and henchmen sprung into action. Because Isaiah Washington had made it clear what the problem was and they sprung into action to change the subject. They, they had called on their usual flunkies. I mean, you had Goldie Taylor and the Roots. I mean, all these out-of-work people. And yet, they're showing you that they are still bucking, buck dancing, and jockeying for a position back at Massa's feet. That even though they don't have a job now, they're, they're, they're jockeying for a position to get another crumb flicked off the table at them. That's what they're doing now. So they wanted to make it very, very clear that, hey, we're not here to, 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 to cause any waves. We're not here for that. That's not what we're here to do. We are here to do masses bidding and change this damn subject by misleading black society from the inside out. This Trojan horse strategy that you take something that looks like it should belong there, but on the inside it has deadly consequences. So they took about the work of, of, of skewing this. But it didn't take off in black society until the root printed it. Now, the reason for that, why the root would have such credibility is because the root is actually owned by the Washington Post. So it's not just a bunch of yahoos who got up one day and said, hey, let me go ahead and see if I can make a website. This is supposed to be made by a, 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 a major mainstream corporate responsible media outlet. That's what it's supposed to be. And it is anything but that. The story was printed by Yisha Callahan. And in a story that was highly plagiaristic, she actually took out whole paragraphs from where she got the story from. Now, she didn't even come up with it on her own. She had gotten the story from the rap on Yahoo. She got the story from them. And she printed up unchanged, copied and pasted unchanged whole paragraphs from a story written by, and this is a white writer on Yahoo named Debbie Emery, who's got all of 400 and some odd followers on Twitter. Now this woman, while claiming that she was giving people the interview that Isaiah Washington had done with Don the Shill Lemon on CNN, what Debbie Emery had done was she sat up here and cherry picked half sentences and in some cases, started adding words in of her own. Now that is libel. She started adding in words on her own. She started adding in words herself. Start adding them in on her own. In order to here this white woman comes out of nowhere amongst a middle of in the middle of black people to say, "Hey, there's a black guy here that says that black people should adapt to white supremacy. Since when has a white writer been so concerned about that?" Well, I guess they got concerned about it as soon as it became apparent that that wasn't really what the issue is. Wouldn't you say? 
I guess they got concerned about it as soon as they realized that that's not what the issue actually is when it was time to try to distract people and deflect and lead them away from what the actual truth of the matter is that was when all of a sudden here comes Debbie Emery to say I'm going to do the dirty work I'm going to take care of it for Massa I'm going to do that for him I got this don't worry Massa I got this I got this. Because she knew. Because they have connections in places that you think are actually in the interests of black people. And I'm telling you that we've been led a fraud and a lie for so long here. And we want to believe that because we want to believe that at some point we're going to get something that we didn't build. That white people are going to take white money from white corporations and build a black media apparatus for us. That's what we're waiting for. This absolute delusion. This fairy tale that we are somehow going to get white people to put black people's interests ahead of their own. Don't you know that if they put their money into it, they, that media apparatus serves their interests, not yours. That's its purpose. It serves their interests, not your interests. When Isaiah Washington said that we need to adapt, he meant that we need to understand that we are in the environment of white supremacy and make the necessary changes in our thinking to recognize the system of white supremacy. Not that we need to surrender to white supremacy. That wasn't what he meant by adapt. When it's cold outside, do you just say, I'm not going to work, I'm not going outside? No. You adapt. You get a coat. You build automobiles that have heating in them. You get snowmobiles, snow machines to clear the road. You don't sit up here and say, I surrender. I will just stay in the house until spring comes back. You adapt to the environment so that you can go out into the environment. That is what adaptation means. Not that you try to appease the environment. Isaiah Washington did not mean appease the environment. When he spoke to Don Lemon, let me tell you that that was the most absolute stalwart, rock-ribbed, uncompromising interview that you've seen from a black man in a very, very, very long time. He called out white supremacy by name, said white supremacy not once but twice. And that was what they wanted to take away. I showed you all where Yahoo posted on their homepage the link took you to the article, the smear article by Debbie Emery, but on Yahoo's homepage, their issue, they said what the issue was. I, that's why I posted it on my video on, you, on YouTube. Adapting to white supremacy, you can see it. You can see that their problem was that he said white supremacy. So Yahoo made it clear that our issue is that he was talking bad about white supremacy. And we want to know who the hell gave him the authority to start discussing white supremacy. That's what we want to know. They made that very clear. Isaiah Washington said that Chris Rock had done nothing wrong. Isaiah Washington said that marching and protesting has done nothing for us. Let me tell you, he hit all the buttons and the white supremacists were screaming. They were shrieking at each other. Damn it, damn it, damn that nigga. How dare he go out there and say it for what it is. Doesn't he know we have the authority and the power to punish him? 
And Isaiah Washington showed them that he wasn't afraid to do that. But here's the problem. The problem is that Isaiah Washington is a member of black society. That's the problem. And because he is a member of black society, that means that he is a member of a group of people who do not have an organized intact community. You see, you have a community of one type or another. You have an intact community or you have a broken community. And black people do have a community, but it is broken. It's missing whole parts. And Isaiah Washington was trying to speak the language of empowerment. Isaiah Washington tried to do something that has not been tried in a very, very, very long time among black people. And we just witnessed why it hasn't been tried. Isaiah Washington attempted to use code speak. He attempted to use code speak among black people. That's the problem. That's the mistake that he made. He attempted to use code speak. And by doing that, the problem with code speak is that the audience who's hearing you has to understand the code words and understand their meanings so that when one when somebody outside of the group, the community hears these words, they take it one way. But you, the intended recipients, accept it the way it's supposed to be. That's how a code works. And unfortunately, black people don't have a code. So Isaiah Washington attempted to speak in code to a people who do not have a code. We don't have a code of speech. We don't have a code of language. We don't have a code of conduct. We don't have a code of ethics. We don't have a code. We don't have one. And Isaiah Washington attempted to invoke one. He attempted to speak to one. And unfortunately, he, 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 he gambled that black people would understand the code when they saw it. And that wasn't what happened. See, black folk are waiting for somebody to come out showboating. That's what we want. We want somebody to do what Malcolm X used to do back in the old days. We want somebody to run up on TV and say, white devils. We want somebody to do that Elijah Muhammad talk that Malcolm X repeated. We want them to do that. And that ain't going to work. That's not going to work. Black folk are the only people on earth who, ex who want somebody to sit up here and buy a damn billboard before we will understand what's being said to us. And that makes people disrespect us out the gate. This childlike infantile intellect and mentality. We want somebody to spell it out for us. Even when we're going to war, we want somebody to spell out to our enemies and our adversaries that we coming for you. That's what we want. We want this childish, simple-minded way of approaching things. We want somebody to sit up here and tell the bad guys... We're coming for you. And that's not the way you do it. Because if you have to advertise to people that you're coming for them, now they can make the necessary steps to counter you. So we need a code. We need a language that only we understand. Or at least a language that is durable. To criticism. We need that. And we don't have that. And that's what Isaiah Washington was attempting to invoke and speak to. 
And the reason that what the root did, that the smear job that they took up for from Debbie Emery and Yahoo is because Debbie Emery and Yahoo understood that we are not a people with a code. And because we're not a people with a code, she came in using a blunt instrument. And that blunt instrument caught on. And the root grabbed that blunt instrument. And that blunt instrument caught on. And as the old saying goes, A rumor can make its way around the world while the truth is still putting his pants on. They never should have been able to do that. We as a people have got to stop this nonsense of opening, leaving ourselves wide the hell open to everybody who wants to take shots at us because we want to tell them and we want to let them know that everybody wants to be simple minded. This simple mindedness has got to die. This idea that, you know, we can sit up here and operate on this 10 IQ level. That's not going to work. That's not going to work. The idea that you're going to defeat white supremacy led by your dumbest is not going to work. And this idea that we do not need a code. This idea that we don't need a code. That we don't need anybody. That we don't need to actually have a, a, a language that we amongst ourselves speak. The idea that we don't need that, that's got to die too. That goes all the way back to the Bible. Jesus was asked, why do you speak in parables? Why do you speak in riddles? And he let them know that's because what I say is not intended for everybody. It's only intended for a certain group of people. And when I say it, the people who hear it, they will know what I mean. Now our enemies will be dumbfounded and confused and trying to convince people that this vague thing that I said means this over here, but they won't be able to prove it. And that's what we want. And as black people, everybody else has got that. Asians, Latinos, whites, Arabs, everybody else has got it. Black people are the only people who demand to speak to our enemies in plain English. And all that does is tell your enemy directly what you got going on. When was the last time that you went on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and saw a white male with stacks of money sitting there counting it and showing it off? When was the last time you saw that? A white male who's about something. Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Mark Z Okay, they're too old. How about Mark Zuckerberg, Sergey and Bryn? How about them over there at Google? They got billions. When was the last time that you saw Mark Zuckerberg get a, 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 a 15 stacks of money and go posting it up online? When was the last time you saw that? I'll wait. You can go ahead and inform me of that one. You see, they don't do that. They don't sit here and broadcast to the world what they got and what they're doing. They give as little information to their opponents, to their adversaries as they can. Meanwhile, over in black society, we're waiting for somebody to sit up here and spell it out for us in boxcar letters. That's got to go. That's got to go. Isaiah Washington hit all the right buttons. He did everything he was supposed to do. 
He threw the long bomb down the field, and our people were not prepared to catch it. Our people weren't ready. Our people were not ready. We were not ready to catch it, and we should have been. We should have been ready to catch that, and we weren't. We want to force all of our spokespeople to go out there and tip white supremacy off to what we're doing and what we're thinking. I was I was talking today to somebody and I, they, they, they were saying about how black folk have to vote Democrat because if we don't, the Republicans are going to do all these horrible things. I said, name one thing that the Republicans would do that Barack Obama hasn't done. Tell me one thing that the Republicans wanted to do to us that Barack Obama has stopped them or blocked them. They've attacked the Civil Rights Act. They've gutted the Voting Rights Act. They've gutted affirmative action. The police are on a murderous rampage. And Barack Obama's Justice Department said, oh, well, them's the breaks. Tell me, what, would you, what has Barack Obama done that Rudy Giuliani would have done differently? Tell me what Rudy Giuliani would have done differently than he did. That's right. And the reason why Barack Obama can get away with imitating Rudy Giuliani and black folk let him get away with it is because black people have a simple-minded mindset that says, we are waiting for white supremacy to buy a billboard. No, we're waiting for white supremacy to invoke the KKK Act. We want white supremacy to create the Ku Klux Klan Act of 2015. And if white supremacy passes the Ku Klux, and it has to have those words in it now, the Ku Klux Klan Act of 2000, you know what? Ku Klux Klan might not even be enough for black people as a group today. That might not even be enough. It would probably be, need, need to be called the I Hate Niggers and Want to Hang Them from Every Lamp Post Act of 2015 and it would have to be worded that way i hate niggers and want to hang them from every lamp post act of 2015 that's what it would have to be that's what it would have to be because we want somebody to speak to us on a very very low simplistic level because if we actually did acknowledge the code speak for what it is, then now you have to act. And understand, most black people don't have the courage to say a third of what Isaiah Washington did. They would be, most black people would be too concerned about keeping their little old job. And you all make a lot less than he does, by the way. They'd be too concerned about keeping their little old position. You all wouldn't even speak in the same code that Isaiah Washington did. And that was why I made the video supporting him because when you got somebody who is willing to run with the ball, you back him. You back him. When you got somebody who is willing to run with the ball, you back him. I was I was posting up here the other, uh, earlier today about how there was a movie from 1994 called Drop Zone with Wesley Snipes. And it was about these crooks who go around parachuting into these places and that's how they uh they hack computers by parachuting in. So they're parachuting on top of buildings and everything else. Well, Wesley Snipes is an FBI agent and he he his brother is killed by this gang of thieves. And so he wants to go find them. So he has to go off into the world of skydiving so that he can go try to find these guys. And he meets this one woman played by Yancey Butler. And if you all remember the uh, Witchblade television show, that's Yancey. Well, she's the skydiving instructor at this little old broke down skydiving school that Wesley Snipes eventually goes to here. Well, she decides to be a jerk first time she takes him up into the plane. And he's just sitting there almost in the fetal position. He doesn't want to move. 
So while he's sitting there, she opens this trap door under him in the plane, and he falls out of the bottom of the plane. So he's just falling and falling and basically falling to his death. And the instructor tells her, you jump out, go get him. All right, all right. So she, Yancey Butler goes and jumps out of the plane and catches up to Wesley Snipes and she hooks her harnesses onto him. And then she opens the parachute. Right before they hit the ground, they actually wind up landing in this, this swamp. They wind up landing in this pond. Wesley is scared to death. He, he's frightened out of the years of his life. Now he's wet. He's soaked. He's muddy. And she gets up and says, Ah, that was pretty good for your first jump. You fell. You lived. Good start. He, he, he. Now, you all know if somebody pushed you out of a plane at 5,000 feet and let you fall and you don't know what to do, you wouldn't think that was funny. And then he lands in a damn pond like that and he's covered in mud. He, <laughs> he. Pretty good for your first jump. You fell. You lived. Good start. And she's giving, he turns around, she's grinning with this thumbs up. Wesley cocks back, gives her a knuckle sandwich. She goes flat on her back in the water. And he says, you fell. You lived. I'm gone. She starts laughing. Now there were some folk, and there are some people listening right now. When you're getting squeamish about it, you're getting antsy about it. Oh, I don't know. If we can talk about this, TBA. Oh, I'm scared, TBA. I'm scared. I'm scared. I don't know. If we can do this. You've got movies out there like Twelve Years a Slave, with white men outright raping black women outright raping them but you all are scared about a black man giving a white woman a Hollywood sucker punch but that that now that disturbs you black women being raped that doesn't bother you we talk about this you know that that's what brings out the coon in people and I'm saying it just like it is because that bothers you I will say it like it is again. That brings out the coon in people. When we start comparing behaviors and then you start getting squeamish, that brings out the coon in people. That brings out the coon. That's what folks do. Now, that was a movie with Wesley Snipes, and at the time, Wesley Snipes was on his way to becoming one of the biggest stars in Hollywood. So, I mean, yeah, that, that movie was actually his name on it. So, I mean, he was he was headlining his own movies. I mean, that the brother was flying high. And let me tell you, a lot of folk were amazed when they when I showed that clip to them. They were like, oh, that white woman let, let them... Make a movie like that? Oh, there was. You couldn't make a movie like that today. Are you kidding me? Yes, we could. We could make a million movies like that today. But you know the reason why it ain't happening? It ain't happening because we don't want to pay for it. We don't want to pay for it. Yancey Butler is doing your bidding. You're supposed to be able to reward people who do your bidding. You're supposed to be able to do that. You see, Kerry Washington is the Negro bedwinch. 
and she's got plenty of white folk who will pay her way and give her benefits for continuing to bed wench. They, that's what the way it works. So guess what? You don't just have Kerry Washington now. You got Kerry Washington, Shonda Rhimes, um, Azalea Banks, uh, Raven Simone. They're lined up now. It's not, forget a coon train, it's a coon parade. They are lined up out here. Everybody is lined up to see if they can get called up to the big house. Now, there would be a similar line in black society. We'd have a similar line of non-black people willing to do our bidding, but nobody's willing to put themselves out there for us like that. And you know why? Because we have established a track record that it does not pay to support us. That's what we've done. We have created a track record where it does not pay to support us. It doesn't benefit you to put your neck out there for black people because black people will not. I didn't say cannot. Black people will not protect you if you do something like that. They won't protect you and there's not very much, not only will they not protect you, there's not even very much reward in doing it. There's not very much reward in doing it. And that's the reason why you don't see it. You don't see it because we've established a firm track record that supporting us doesn't pay. And unfortunately, we validated that with Isaiah Washington. We validated that. Now, if we want to get our own bed winches, we're going to have to pay for it. And we're not going to be able to go out there and, and brag about it. Show me, show me the white executives who are bragging about Kerry Washington. Show them to me. Show me the white executives who are bragging about the coon fest that is Empire. Tell me, where are they? Show me Rupert Murdoch puffing his chest out about empire show it to me show it to me you see he's not gonna buy a billboard he's just gonna put the show out there and let it ride now my phone lines are piling up over here so i'm gonna get to those in just a few moments um if you're on the line right now if you didn't press the number one when you called in you need to press the number one, otherwise you're in the queue to talk to me. So just so we get that out of the way, if you're on the line listening, if you didn't press the number one when you called in, you need to press that. Otherwise, you're in the queue to talk here. And if you're in the queue to talk, you're going to have to talk. And if you don't, we're going to have to cancel your ability to talk tonight. And that's just the way it's going to have to be. In any case, what we have demonstrated is that it does not pay. It doesn't pay for people outside of black society to come in and promote our interests. It doesn't pay because we vote irrationally. We spend money irrationally. We speak irrationally. We support things irrationally. There's no consistency to it. None. This is why your politicians don't listen to you because we should be voting as a group of black people. And as soon as it's time to talk about black interests, there's always a segment amongst us that says, Hey, this is my opportunity to sell every last one of you Negroes out for some attention. And that's how you ended up with Yisha Callahan and her kind. We have always got a group of backstabbing bastards who have no problem selling out every single other person here for the interests of themselves being promoted against the interests of everybody else. 
So it doesn't pay to support black people's interests as a group for that reason. Other people look at us and say, it doesn't pay to support them. You could have had a million movies and you would have had a million Yancey Butlers lined up. But you will not pay. You will not build the economic infrastructure. You will not build the media infrastructure that will promote and protect and insulate them after you have, after they have dared to do your bidding. You haven't demonstrated that you are willing to do that. I didn't say that you can. I said you haven't demonstrated that you're willing. Now, it's one thing when somebody else just takes advantage of you. It's quite another thing when you lay down and tell them take advantage of me. That's different. That's a whole lot different. We're going to go ahead and open up the phone lines here right now. Let's go ahead and see if we can grab caller from 905. You're on live with the Black Channel. Caller from 905, you're on live with the Black Channel. Okay, caller from 905 apparently is metalworking. Caller from 412, you're on live with the Black Channel. Okay, yet another evening with the Mollies, the people with the Mollies out here. Although it could be a string of white supremacists and whatnot. Hello to the FBI and the CIA and uh, Stormfront and friends, since these guys do like to get active on my broadcast, which is perfectly fine here. Uh, hello, bring two friends, bring two enemies. We are not worried or concerned. Caller from 773, you're on live with the Black Channel. Yes, uh, this is Terrell from Chicago. What's on your mind, brother? I just wanted to say everything you are uh, saying is totally right. I go through it every day. And what in particular are you referring to? Uh, well, I just got my taxes, and, and they, they selling foreclosures left for like $15,000, $20,000, you know, and uh, it's just easy to turn a profit on them. And I tried to go into business with my brother, and – all he needed to put up was like $5,000, but he wanted to get the whole, like, like the whole pie. Like, he wanted to get equal to me. I'm putting in 15000 but he only putting in five. But he wanted to get half and half. But it's, I'm like, it don't work that way, you know? So some people just don't get it. Well, you have... A group of people among us who, you know, I, 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 I've told you all before that there are two types of, of there are two types of monetary philosophy in black society. You've got economics and you got niggonomics. Yeah. And clearly there's a large segment in black society who is dogged and determined to keep practicing niggonomics. And to keep doing all the things that don't work. We are waiting for white people to build our economic infrastructure. We're waiting for white people to build our educational infrastructure. We're waiting for white people to build our social infrastructure. We're waiting on other people to come along and do these things for us. And we don't want to sit down and just simply do the necessary legwork that is required to build these things. You're going to have yeah. to do that. You are going to have yeah. to understand what business is, and you're going to have to understand what your stake in it is. And this idea that we can get something that we did not pay for, this philosophy that we are going to get something that we didn't build, that's got to die. That's got to die. Now, let me find out a couple of things about your brother here. Now, where does your brother live? Uh, he's on the west side of Chicago. I'm on the south side. Okay. How old is your brother? Uh, 43. Okay. 
Is your brother married? Does he have children? Yes. He so, got, he's married, has six children. He's married and has six children. Yes. How much a year does your brother make? <laughs> no more than like $10,000 a year. He makes $10,000 a year. What, is this Negro on disability? Uh, he does, does odd jobs. Oh, okay. And, uh, yeah, all right. He's one of them. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do, now, does he have six children by the same woman? Yes. So she's the mother of all his children? Yes. He might want to check the DNA on that one. But in any case... Okay, he's got six <laughs> mouths to feed, and his contribution is $10,000. Yeah, that's that. Let me repeat that for everybody one more time. This man's brother has six, one, two, three, four, five, six mouths to feed, and his yearly income to support those six mouths is about what fifteen hundred dollars a piece round that yep so his children get about fifteen hundred dollars a year in financial support from their father Now that beggars the question, how in the hell did he end up with $5,000 to invest? Taxes. Taxes. Oh, yeah, yep. yeah, because since he's such a bum, he actually gets the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit and a bunch of money that he didn't actually work for. Yep. Okay. So here he is, and he figures the government is paying his way. So he wants to go to his brother, and he's like, hey, I want you to take care of me too. Now, in other words, he wants to live like a ward of the state, like a foster child of yeah. the state. That here's white daddy's state government, and he is just another one of the children, not even a man. He's just another one of the kids. He's just another one of the kids. Yep. I help out with what I can with the kids, you know, but. This is why we have generational poverty in black society. Because we've got a bunch of people out here operating and living as if they're on a plantation system. And understand something. We didn't have this problem 50 years ago. Black people have actually regressed. It was time for us to pick the ball up and run with it. And rather than pick it up and run with it, we chose to regress. Thank you, civil rights generation. Black people chose to regress. We had escaped the plantations. We shook that mess off. And then we chose to turn around and walk back to Egypt. Well, back to the plantation. back Not back to Egypt, but back to Gomorrah. We chose to go back to that. And your brother is looking to be somebody's damn ward. Somebody's charity case. Now, brother, yeah. I don't know how long you've listened to me, but I've explained this before. The problem with all... Black folk are addicted to these stupid, ignorant little come-ups. Everything that we do is about a come-up, and a come-up simply means getting something for nothing. So we sit yeah. around with these yeah. petty little schemes trying to get a come-up. And the problem is, there ain't no... There are, you, you're not going to come up on no big dollars. You can come up on some pennies. But you're not going to come up on big money. You're not going to do that. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. 
you are not going to come up on $10,000, $50,000. You'll come up on $3,000. You might be able to come up on $5,000, but here's the problem. Even if you get a little, even for the people who are on Section 8, food stamps, welfare, so SSI, do you know what the problem is with all these government programs and all these people who are sitting up here pretending that they came up because of that? The problem is that you can only get on those programs so long as you agree to remain poor and impoverished. Yeah. You can't be at a decent income and get on that. So rather than get up off your ass and get to something better, they're saying, forget this. Forget this. Let the kids grow up in poverty so I can get an extra $3,000, $4,000 that I didn't work for. I will wait for that once a year thing like Santa Claus as opposed to actually doing something that will benefit my children. Do you all realize just how much his brother hates his own children? He does not get along with that woman. You ain't even got to tell me the story. He does not get along with that woman. He does not. He doesn't. How much does she weigh? And tell the damn truth. <laughs> I don't want to come down on a sister like that. You know, she she a little over, she a little overweight. A little overweight. What? I just don't want to come down. You know, I've been knowing her for like twenty years, man. I don't. Okay, it's just you, me, and a few thousand people. Don't worry. <laughs> but in any case, you know, she, she what, what, yeah, she what that overweight. what that means, brothers and sisters, is Sidibe. Now she then has six children, six, six, and he doesn't want to do any better for the kids because he's afraid of the reason why your brother has worked so hard to stay broke is because that's the only way that he can keep that woman from expecting more from him. And that's why he burdened her down and bogged her down with so many kids. Uh. To make it where now dudes do that to handcuff females. He wasn't able to take care of the first child. What makes him think he can take care of the sixth? And there's no way in the hell that they're not on public assistance. There's no way. No way. You are not going to convince me that they're not on public assistance. There's no You're way. Right. You're right. Okay. Th th thank you very much. Okay. So basically, he's raising his, his children not to be kings and conquerors. He's raising his children to be wards of the state. Now, I want to tell you something. Black men, and I'm talking to the men right now. Black men... That's the kind of crap that destroys your family, your children's, and your community's respect for you. Your children do not have any respect for you when they understand and they know that you could not take care of them the state did. They have respect for the state. They don't have respect for you. Your children do not respect you when they, when they understand that you need the state in order to take care of them. They respect the state. There's no reason to respect you. You ain't built nothing for them. Uncle Sam has built something for them. You've built nothing. There is nothing that they can look at or point at in their lives that benefits them that you are responsible for. Your, your kids don't have any respect for you. And your woman doesn't have any respect for you either. Can we just keep that all the way real? That woman does not have any respect for him.
She's stuck with his ass, but she doesn't have any respect for him. Now I'm telling y'all right now, the first Negro pull up with a car that's less than four years old and she's hopping in it. <laughs> and you laughing cause you like, yeah, cause you haven't told me how old your brother's car is yet. Does your brother, <laughs> you're right. Does your you're brother, right. does your brother have a car? Now, I mean, oh, yeah, let's see, that's the, that's the, that's one of the problems too, cause he don't even really need me to really buy a house, you know, he got like, uh, four cars, you know, between him and his, uh, wife, they got like four cars, so he could just sell the cars, you know, and just get his own, get his own house and do his own thing, you know, so it's like, I ain't even understood why he just didn't do that, so. Yeah, that tells you a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, that's why he, he, he you can't he's... always do business with your family. Well, you can't do business with a fool, whether you're related to him or not. Yeah. You can't do business with a fool, whether you're related to them or not. Yeah. I mean, and, and just think about that, everybody. That his woman, how long has he been with that woman? I didn't say how long they've been married. How long has he been with that woman? About 20 years. 20 years. And did you say he's 43 or what? Yeah. Okay. 43. 20 years. He's been with her since he was 23 years old. Yep. Okay. And he's got four cars making $10,000 about a year. Yep. What kind of cars does he have? Uh, I got like a 2005 Caravan. Okay, that's, uh, that's, that's her. Well, I'm talking about one that he paid for, brother. One that he paid for. One that is in his name that he mm -hmm. paid for, not no family car. The car that he went and bought and paid for in with his own money, and it's in his name. That That's one of his, yeah. Okay. When did he buy this? 15 year old car about two years three years ago okay he bought it recently okay what's, yeah. the, what's the next car uh his wife got a hhr uh 2007 okay i didn't ask you what she bought brother listen to me closely I'll, I'll say this one more time. Okay, just, one that he paid for with his own money that's in his name. Ain't no black man going out buying no caravan. So that's her car. Okay, and, okay. And he got a he got a ninety nine uh Chevy conversion van, that's his. And he got a a old school like uh Chevy Caprice, like a eighty six. Wow. And I guess he just got three cars then, three. An 86 Chevy Caprice. Yes. That car is old enough to host this broadcast. <laughs> that car is old enough to go film my next documentary. That car is old enough to join the military. Now, tell me, what assets does he have? What did you say? What assets does he have? Uh, that's it, just the uh, cars. So he doesn't have any assets. All he's got are two cars that both of them combined you couldn't sell them for three thousand dollars yep now what does that say to his children Excuse 
Excuse me? What does that say to his children? I, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't understand it. Me personally, I, I see it. I just see it as a waste of money because you got to pay insurance for all those cars, taxes, registration, city sticker, maintenance. To me, it don't make no sense, so I could never understand it. So, Yeah. Yeah. So he's driving this. Now, if he's got an 86 Caprice, that's the square model. Yeah. That's the square one. That's not even the rounded one that everybody wants from the 90s. Because I used to have a 95 Impala, which basically was the Caprice with a different grill and a different trunk. But yeah, he, got he the, doesn't the even have like that. Everybody like the, he got the one that everybody liked to put the rims and the sounds in. Yeah. So I bet you his car's got a nice stereo system in it. And the children have what? Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. You ain't got no access to leave them. You ain't got nothing. I mean, live and check the check. Brothers and sisters, what is an asset? An asset is something that provides you with income that you own, control, and can pass down to your children. That those cars are not assets because he cannot sell those cars for more than he purchased them for. He couldn't even make a taxi cab out of them. They're too old. No. And the bad part of it is he had uh, rims and sounds on, on the Chevy 86 uh, Caprice, and he had it in my auntie's garage, and my uncle wound up uh, setting them up to get the rims and the sounds stolen. Yeah. So that was like $3,000 he had put into that that got stolen, so... So he spends thousands of dollars on a speaker system. He's got six damn children. How old is his oldest child? Uh, 19. Okay, so his oldest child is about grown now. Yeah. And has what from his father to go and face the massive influx of Latinos and Arabs that you all, and Russians that you all are experiencing in Chicago. I know the deal, brother. I know the deal. You're having a huge influx of yeah. Russians, Arabs, and Latinos. And what is he sending his children out to compete with them with? Uh, nothing. I, I try to I try to help because I do construction. Like uh, right now I'm laid off, so I, I do like demo work for different little local construction companies. And I'll uh, take my nephews with me and things. But I also I, uh, I work in an oil refinery. I'm in the union, and I just want, and I work around like about twenty thousand white people. And I just want to say everything you say about them not taking any mercy on us is is completely right. They don't. I just work with middle class white people, and they don't, they don't care nothing about our struggle. They don't care about innocent people getting killed they don't they just don't care if you bring it up they they shoot it right down they say hey i would have did it too he he's too big and too big black and strong you know i would have shot him too that's exactly what they say they say that about trayvon mike brown that's how all of them feel so you're right on with that well tamir rice wasn't too big but they'll they'll co-sign that they'll co-sign that one too we are in the midst of a they race. Said, We're in the midst of a race war. And your brother is saying that we can depend on the very people who are at war with us to feed and clothe and house and take care of his children. That's treason. That's treason against his own children. That's a war crime.
Yep. This is a grown man, and his children are going to be calling you father before it's over. Because they're going to remember that the things that they built in this world, they don't have him to thank for anything. They don't have any legacy from him. He's just the person who brought him in this world. They don't have nothing to thank him for. They don't have anything to thank him for. Do you all know why in cities like Chicago, and I'm just going to tell the truth like it is, Terrell. Do you know why it is in Chicago that we get so many stories out of Chicago of young black people robbing their parents, their grandparents, killing their parents, their grandparents, and all for money? Yeah. It's because of things like this. A 90%, 92%, last time was checked, but over 90% of black teens in Chicago are unemployed. That means basically all of them. That if you are a black teenager in the city of Chicago, you can't get a job. You can't get one. But nope. but your daddy got 15s in his 86 Caprice. <laughs> you can't get a job, but your daddy got 24s on his Chevy Caprice. Yep. You see, we want to talk about taking care of our kids and that once again we demand to dumb it down to this to this to this down syndrome level of retardation. That we want to dumb it down because we want the bar to be low as hell so we can be as negligent as hell to our children. We want people to say that if you fed and clothed your kids, you took care of them. Taking care of your children goes far beyond just feeding and clothing them. Did you see about their future? What did you prepare for their future? Feeding and clothing them is a given. And we want somebody to give us a damn Academy Award for a given. What else, what did you actually prepare for your children when they get grown? That's when niggas get quiet. We get quiet as hell when that happens. We get real quiet because we know we ain't left these kids a damn thing. Your brother knows that stupid ass car is worthless to his children. He knows that. And he doesn't care. Because what happens to the children is not even an afterthought to him. His priority is, well... Now, I'm just going to say this like it is, brother, and you don't even have to say nothing about it, but I'm just going to say it just like it is because I'm not here to sugarcoat the damn thing for nobody. That woman is not the only female he done slept with in the last 10 years. She's not. Because he's got too much chasing hood rat behavior in him. Way too <laughs> much. Way too much. That car that he's got... That car is not an aspirational car. This week at the New York Auto Show, Cadillac introduced the CT6. That's going to be their new flagship sedan, their new large sedan to compete with the big ones, the Mercedes S-Class, um, the BMW 7 Series. Well, Cadillac is bringing out the CT6, and that's supposed to be the one that competes with all those large European sedans and the Lexus sedans. This, this is supposed to be the one that competes with the Audi, um, the Audi A, at least the Audi A6. I don't think it's quite, uh, we haven't gotten the price point yet, so I don't think it's quite going to compete. I, I think it's going to compete with the Audi A6, but not the A8. Not the A7 or A8, I don't believe. Like I say, we're still waiting to find out 
the price points and stuff like that. Now tell us exactly which model of Audi they're aiming at. But ba basically, there this car is made to aim at the top of the line European and Japanese sedans. The top of the line. And the president of Cadillac, Johan Denishin, he said that this is an aspirational car. That this is the car you buy. This isn't a car that gets you where you want to go. You buy this car to show people where you've already gotten. Not one damn thing sitting in front of your brother's apartment in that housing complex, not one damn thing sitting in front of there is an aspirational vehicle. Not a one. If the most that a man aspires to in his life is a set of speakers and some wheels, that Negro needs to be wearing some damn pampers. Because he has not transcended his own childhood. He's a grown man operating on an adolescent level. And then he's got kids. <sighs> then he's got kids. And he's going to turn his children out into the world young, black, destitute, and angry. Because they're being told, okay, Go figure it out. Because your father didn't see it as necessary to build nothing. And your mammy sat there and held on to him even after it was clear he wasn't going to build Jack nothing. Your children come out young, black, destitute, and angry. Because all they can do is struggle now. He's got 20 years. 20 years of his life that he was supposed to be spending doing something for his kids. And what does he have to show his own children after 20 years? What does he have to show them? He is an embarrassment to those children. He's a disgrace. He's an absolute disgrace to those children. Man, I gotta go. This too depressing. <laughs> he disconnected, y'all. Can't really say I blame him. No, I'm not going to have any mercy. I'm not going to have any. Damn that. Mercy and forgiveness are for repentant souls. You don't have mercy. You don't have mercy on somebody who would betray his own children. I don't have mercy on someone who would, who would commit treason against his own blood. I don't have any mercy for you. Caller from 858, you're on live with the Black Channel. Caller from 858, last time you're on live with the Black Channel. Okay. Caller from 334, you're on live with the Black Channel. Hey, Mr. Black, what's going on? This is Bill Green from the uh, TMI group. Bill Green, now you've been uh, buying real estate out there, haven't you? Yes, sir. I, uh, been, um, I knew about the tax list for years. I just uh, just haven't really moved on it. And uh, Well, let me find out a couple of things. Now the time. Let me find out a couple of things here first, okay? Just so I can set this up for everybody. Okay. Now, for those of you who don't know, he's been buying real estate in Alabama. Um, basically, he's been buying adjudicated and tax delinquent properties in Alabama. Now, you just, this was your first time buying off the tax list? It was. Okay. I would usually get on the list years ago, but I wouldn't 
Okay, well, I, I just want to make sure this is your first time you actually bought anything. You never actually bought anything before. How long have you been listening to me? Yes. Uh, about a year now. Okay. Have you heard me talk about the uh, adjudication and tax list before? I haven't. Okay, because I must say, it's been about two years, two or three years since I actually spoke about the adjudication and tax list. But let's just go down the list here, okay? Because like I say, this is one of okay. those moments where when people call it and whatnot, this is to establish my credibility with everybody else to let you know that, hey, I'm not guessing my way through this. There's a reason why we do it like this. All right. Now, first of all, did, now did you, because it sounded like you were saying that you bought from the state, not the city. Is that correct? Yes. The, the, yes. Okay. Uh, so. um, it's for the state. The, the, tax, the state in, in Alabama, it works. The state takes it back and you go down to the uh, Revenue Commission to get the list. For okay, is that is that even county. is that even for the cities? Uh yes, it is. Okay, that's a little unusual, but all but right. Let, so let, let me say one thing. Let me say one thing. You actually may be more knowledgeable than I am. What I've done is I've uh, read a few books and I listen to this show called Black Economics, uh, and they mm -hmm. talk about it all the time. So what I do is I. I just went and saw the list and made some offers, and I've been educating myself. So I'm still in the midst of educating myself. I mean, no, no, no. But... Look, look, look. You've got the properties, okay? So, I mean, if I sat up here and told you that you have to pay $800 to get the list and you have to hire a lawyer in order to buy a property, what would you tell me? Uh, no, you, you can do the list online for free. Okay, and, okay, okay. Do well, stop. To... Slow down, Bill. Stop. Slow down. Okay. Because the problem that we have in black society is disinformation. We have a bunch of people who have failed and a bunch of people who, when you confront them about their failures, they will not hesitate to lie. They won't hesitate to look you in the face and lie to you and tell you that all these things that we're talking about, they, they won't hesitate to lie to you and tell you all kinds of made up garbage in order to make it seem like they know what they're talking about or just to get you off their backs. They don't have a problem with lying to you about it. So it's very, very important that when we have somebody who actually has the facts that we make it clear that it's like, hey, this is important because this is one of the reasons that there are people out there who want to do this stuff. They go talk to some liar or some failure who's willing to lie to them. And then now they got disinformation and then they just say, well, hell, I'm just not going to try anything. I'm just not going to try anything now. So understand, you bought your properties, you know now. Now, there may be little things you can do to finagle and, you know, tweak the formula. But brother, you know. Now, you know. You have taken it from start to finish. You have gone in on the property. You got the list. You paid for it. And I'm assuming, has the state sent you your, uh, has the state given you, and in Louisiana we have titles for it and whatnot, has the state sent you your title? Well, it's a deed. Um, okay. I'm going to pick it up this Friday. Uh, I was going to get one property, but I posted in the group, I just found a 16-unit apartment building for $2,300. And right. I'm going to get that. Friday. I'm going to I'm going to give them that money and I'm not going to do the quadruplex. Okay, well, like I say don't 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 sit on your laurels, but here's the real thing. Now, I did take a look at the properties that you posted, okay? I did take okay. a look at those. So, I saw it. It looks it looks like it's in an out of the way neighborhood. Well, well what happened um in 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 Montgomery, there's a Alabama State University is very close and that property used to be adjacent to some projects. Okay. What's going on is they've come in and completely tore the projects down all the way. And they're, they've built some real nice high-end uh, apartments there, and people are paying, like, premium rent right adjacent to downtown. So well, you better not sit on that. No, longer... no, as soon as you said University of yeah. Alabama is building over there, you, you, you should it's close by. You shouldn't – don't – I wouldn't wait on that unless I took a look at that those pictures, brother. It looks kind of rough there. And that means you haven't had an opportunity to physically inspect that building's plumbing, electricity. See, that's usually what buries you is not the purchasing of the property. What buries people is usually the renovation. 
That's usually what buries you. Because that will go into tens of thousands of dollars, especially for an apartment building like the one you're looking at. That could go into tens of thousands. So here's what I'm going to suggest to you. I don't buy a property without having my, my, my building inspector go out for me. I have a licensed property inspector and he goes out for me. I don't buy anything that he hasn't looked at. I don't touch it. Do you have one? Yes. Okay. Well, so I you, have each. I'm, I, what I do is I sell the work out, so I get a plumber, an electrician. No, 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 no. That's not what I mean, brother. Okay, everybody. See, this is why it's important to know what you could get yourself into. Have you actually been inside the structure? Yes. Okay. Are you qualified to check for mold? Yes. You're qualified to check for mold. Well, no, 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 no. Let me let me rephrase that. I was I'm a licensed contractor. So, okay, but that's but not, I'm not. I don't remove mold. Yeah, that's that's, that's not like what I'm that. that's not what I'm asking you though. Because understand yeah. something, if that place has mold, if it has asbestos, you won't know that. If it has, if you've got a problem with integrity on the beams and whatnot. And as a contractor, you might see certain things. And again, you might not. Like I say, that's going to be something really, really crucial and critical. Me, I don't touch it unless I have a building inspector do it for me. Because understand something. If somebody does try to raise an issue later, who are who is the city or the state going to send out? A building inspector. Yes. So I want to make sure I don't beat you to the punch on this. So I pay a few hundred dollars. They inspect the property for me. And sometimes the answer has been no. Sometimes I've had them go in and the answer is no. Other times the answer is yes. But for me, I, I wouldn't do it without it. But if you feel like you can evaluate the properties on your own, that's one option that you do have. Um, with that being the case, you know, if you if you are sure that you have the ability to take care of plumbing and electrical issues, those are usually going to be the two majors. If you're ready for the plumbing and ready for the electrical, and if you are ready to take care of the exterior of the building, and by that I mean it may need not just repainting, but if you're prepared to resurface it, because it has that projects look to it, in all honesty. It's got that projects look to it. It might be worth your while to see about doing something that takes that look away from it. You see what I mean? Yes, sir. It might be something as simple as an awning. It might be something as simple as, you know, column pillars, you know? There are simple things you can do. There are more involved things you can do. But don't just say, I'm going to fix this up and flip it real fast and grab the cash and run this that's what we as black folk do and we don't actually have investments because of that we actually take an investment and transform it into a into a hustle what i would do if it were me is i would go and take a look at the new structures being built nearby i'd go take a look at those and then i would see what i could do to incorporate those types of design elements or color schemes into this existing property that's what I would do if it were me. I would take a look at these folk are building brand new stuff. That means they're betting big that they found a formula that works. Why would you want to reinvent the wheel? If it were me, I'd be looking in that direction. Simply because, as you said, it's an up and coming neighborhood. University of Alabama is nearby. We got new construction going up. Why would you want your construction to not look like the new construction? Because that's what people are going to judge it on. They're going to look at yours and say, hey, that's old construction. And then even though it's in the same area, they'll be your property may wind up sitting simply because people look at it and say, well, that's older construction. You know, I bet you the inside of it looks a mess and, and whatnot. You see what I mean? Yes. That's that. If I had one suggestion for you, that would be it. If you're sure you got your plumbers and stuff, that's okay. You got that going for you. My next step would be making sure that this thing is ready to compete with the new construction that is coming up in that neighborhood. Otherwise, 
you'll be watching other people get $800 a month rent. And for some reason you got six units, but can't fill up more than three of them. Cause in our mind's eye, everything goes swimmingly in our mind's eye. Everything goes well. It's once the rubber meets the road that things get tough. It's once it's time to get people to part with their money that all of a sudden, you know, it's like, hey, they're getting picky about things. Well, hell yeah, they're getting picky about things. It's their money. They can afford, they're the, they're the ones with the money. They can afford to be picky. And they will be. Especially if there's new construction in the area, they will be. Unless the area just turns red hot like Silicon Valley or, you know, Brooklyn or something like that. Unless it just turns red hot, that'd be the case. But then again, even still, why would you want to be the guy in the neighborhood getting $600 a month or $700 a month when everybody else is getting 900 and 1000 Why would you want to be that guy? I, I wouldn't, actually. I, I would try to be some, something comparable to the properties adjacent to it yeah i mean that's the that's the way i was thinking yeah if i if i had a suggestion to make to you based on everything else you told me that's the one because it looks like you got a pretty good it, it, it looks like you know i see some because i see the one structure but i saw like one behind it i think it was yeah, it's, it's two one to the side of it yeah it's like two of them side uh, by side okay now yes. are you getting you're getting both of them or just one of them both you, of them. Okay, you're gonna get both of them. Yeah, that's gonna yeah, be a pretty. Each unit is 143 dollars a piece. Yeah, that's that's a pretty good amount of acreage right there, man. That's that's a pretty good that's a pretty good slice of land you got there. So, yeah. it, like I say, now based on what I'm seeing here, of course you know this. I mean, you're looking you're looking at more than just renovating the buildings. You gotta renovate them on the insides. You gotta get that up to code. Then we got the outside. We gotta get that up to code. Looks like you're gonna need to do some landscaping. Yes. You're going to have to do some landscaping because the grass is all trodden down and stuff. It's not rocket science, and it's not something that's really going to be tremendous on that end. But I, I do see you spending somewhere in the neighborhood of fifty to to $100,000 to renovate these things. I was actually thinking about one fifty to mm. one sixty. dollars Okay. Um, that's, I was going to spend about ten each one because I, I was going to put a one-ton – Put it one ton per 500 square feet. It's two bedroom, one baths, each unit, and it's about 500 square feet. So I'm looking at 16 one ton units, which I think that's 500 square feet each ton. So I mean, ten of those. I mean, 16 of those. Okay. Uh, now, what were you going to do the now about the apartments themselves? What do they need? What What are your plans for those? Um, some of them are decent as far as the wiring. Like I walked in today with a. Uh, some people that used to work with me because I used to flip houses full time for like five years and I got my old crew and we met up and we went through that a day and went and looked at all the different uh, properties. Some of them are real bad. Like people have been coming in there, taking a dump, just throwing it in there. And then some of them have been boarded up. The walls are pretty intact. The good thing is they're all on switches. They're not, um, what is it? knob and bell and knob wiring there to actually the wiring's up to date it's okay. actual switches and is not fuses or anything like that okay so, so you've actually got so, circuit you know, breakers as opposed to fuse boxes yes okay so we're exactly. at least it's that when circuit breakers are not really like i say at least it's not ancient okay so you're not really dealing with a fuse situation yeah. so that that's good um, and the walls aren't plaster either that i hate plaster so well what, what the, the, so they are sheetrock okay they are actual sheetrock okay good yeah. All right, we're not dealing with plaster. We're dealing with actual sheetrock. Okay, what were you planning on doing with... So you just just planning on just basically what? Just cleaning them out and giving them a fresh coat of paint, basically? Some of them, some of them like the one they've been taking a dump, I'm taking, I'm taking that to the studs all the way. I got... It's just... It's, the odor is unbearable. Burns your nose. I'm going to gut that one. I'm going to gut them all the way out, go with hardwood. I can get that. I know a place I can get that for like 89 cents a square foot. Good. Um, Good. and I'm just going to go, it's unfinished, but I'm going to go come with all the way hardwood, give it this loft like look to it. Um, and the bathrooms, I'm going to go with just, you can get like these plastic tubs at Lowe's for like two fifty three hundred dollars $300. I'm going to just go, I'll just redo the bathrooms and take a, a sawzall and a jackhammer and bust up all that old towel and come in there with some vinyl 
and uh, just just bring it all the way back to uh, to the old, you know, give it an update look. It's going to look, basically it's going to look brand new on the inside. Some of them have what they call knockdown where they came in and sprayed it with some sheetrock mud yeah. and took a knife and smoothed it out. Yeah. I hate that. I'm going to bust yeah, that that's, out. Yeah, that's terrible. And, and come back all the way with it. Yeah, that's terrible. I mean, at least get the damn popcorn or something, you know, at least do that. But just yeah. all that, you know, like you're making a peanut butter sandwich. Get real, dude. Yes. All right, fine. Um, <laughs> yeah. like, I mean, hey, I've been there. I've done that. You know, I got the T-shirt and the sandals. Um, somebody was asking here, what was the what was the Property List website exactly? Now, it's in Alabama, everybody. It's not nationwide. This is Alabama now. I have to – hold on one second. Um, I'm on my phone. I can't – but what happened um, in each state, which you could do is you can go to a search engine and just say tax okay. for sale, hey, hey, and you can name your state. Bill. Don't do that, Bill. Say it again. Don't do it. Don't do that. Okay. Don't do that. That's a bad look, brother. Don't don't get to the ninety nine yard line and then fumble the ball. Don't do that. What's the <laughs> what's the website, Bill? It is the I believe it's the Revenue Commissioner. Revenue Commission. You believe it's the Revenue Commission? Yes. I, I don't have it with me. I will have to look at it. You I've have... been looking at it for so long I don't even remember I don't I just have it saved. I just click on it. It's mm-hmm. in my browser. Well, where's your browser, Bill? I don't have my laptop. I'm in my car. You're in your car. Okay. Well, Bill, what I want you to do is I want you to I, go. I posted in the group. I want you to go and get that for us so that everybody else can actually see it, so that they can actually see okay. what it is these people ask of them. And even if they're in a different state, at least they've got somebody like you. I mean, like say Louisiana makes it a damn pain to uh, deal with. I don't even. I don't even know if we actually have a website that deals with that specifically because I it's, it's a pain because they have adjudication lists, but that doesn't really help you because so many of the lists are actually not accurate. So not, and I'm not fully convinced that's not by design. So Louisiana makes it a damn pain. Other states actually make it easier. Um, but what it'll do is in a situation like this, it gives other people, you know, the ability to see exactly what the process is, even if they're not in Alabama. At least they can see what it looks like and how the process is, and at least they're not just jumping off in their own website because it's not like somebody's there to sit there and walk them through it where they are. At least some information will help them better than no information at all. And that's the one thing I'm concerned about. So as far as that's concerned, I want them to know exactly what the website is. I want to know exactly what it is so they can at least see it. Now, about these apartments here, one other thing, because you mentioned about there's one that you're going to wind up gutting until you get to the jack studs, which is fine. I don't have a problem with that. Have you considered doing something different with them? And by that, I mean, have you considered, instead of trying to keep the number of units you have, we're going with something like maybe making some studios out of them or actually, you know, combining apartments and whatnot so you can up the number of bedrooms or bathrooms to it. I haven't considered that. Um, Think it over. Think it over as far as like an, okay. what they call an op- open floor concept. Think about that. And if you have to take out a wall, assuming that they're not load bearing, of course. But if you're able to combine them and whatnot and really increase the floor space of it, those kind of things give you an edge. Like I say, it's better to have it not needed than needed not have it. But if it's something, like I say, then that'll have to go into your plans or whatever and you have to think it over. And that'll be something, but like I say, at least that'd be something that you would have as an option. It might be something that you'd be able to do as an option. You might want to think that over too. Will do. That's something that a lot of folk don't think of. But like I say, when the white guys do this kind of stuff on Property Brothers and whatnot, the first thing that they start thinking of is, you know, what is it to actually get the rents for that? And this is why you need to start checking out these other people who are building stuff. Find out the square footage that these people are offering people. And then, because you're, you're building stuff, even though, you know, the electrical is up to code, the, the, the construction is older. And what was acceptable for a housing project may not even be, a, you may not even be able to get it up to what they would expect, you know, now for what they're expecting, the square footage. So it's good to at least be able to have the option of doing that. Where you're able to just sit here and say, hey, we can give you, you know, 1,500 square feet. Now, it's going to cost you $1,800, but we we have a couple of units available for this, that, and the other. You know, we 
opened up the windows over here so it's got a nice look on it and stuff you can put a little fake balcony on it if you want to or whatever you know just at least it gives them the option like i say i mean you, this will be a structure that you own so there's no reason you can't be as creative as you want to be with it now don't put in things like ceiling fans and about the balcony thing i probably wouldn't do that simply because those are hazards okay um don't do ceiling fans because like ceiling fans that don't work are a pain um but what I'm saying is that, you know, don't, don't, don't think small, you know, don't, don't bankrupt yourself neither. Get it in your head, get an idea, but just check out everything. Floor space, amenities, what you said about the hardwood flooring, you know, think about that kind of thing. Think about the type I'm of flooring, found. think about the kind of, the kind of flooring, think about the kind of like with your, with the, uh, with the, um, with the ceiling, for example, you know, like I'm looking at this thing right here, this uh it's hard for me to see from the roofs uh, these roofs look slanted it's kind of hard for me to tell but are they slanted or are no, they it, are uh, they flat that was the app it was just the app i did okay it, uh, it's straight okay so it's, the roofs are flat it's not slanted okay you yeah. got you got flat roofs are they are they tar on them or what um the roof oh i'm sorry man i thought you meant roofs Roof, roof, the roof. roofs are no. The roofs are just they're uh, got a low they got a low slope. They're um, three tab shingles. Uh, they're decent. There's one spot in one of them where I think the roof was leaking, it, but I picked up in there and saw the rafters. They were still solid. Okay. They weren't rot rotten. Okay, no. I had no a light order. and peeked up in there. Okay, so I no. just got to make sure I cover up that hole. Good, good, good. Okay, now in a case like that, for example, you might want to start considering skylights. Okay. We got a problem on the roof. If now, like I say, I don't know if, if the deck is damaged or not. If the if it's got water damage, you probably got issues with the deck. It may be just as simple as the shingles. If it has shingles on it, I'm assuming if it's sloped, it's got shingles. If it's it may be something as simple as the shingles, but then again, maybe not. But if it is an issue with the deck, that's a perfect time to start saying, "Well, hell, I got to come up here and do it anyway." We might want to, and like I say, that might be something you want to test out. You might want to test it out on certain units. Now, don't bust your building up and don't chop it up into pieces and don't have a bunch of crazy, you know, a bunch of crazy uh, scatterbrained stuff going on. You don't want the place looking schizo. You want it to be uniform. But like I say, if if it's something, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you these ideas because I don't want you to, these are small ideas basically. And if you've done contracting, you have you ever put in a skylight before? I've never done a skylight. I've done other things, but okay. not a skylight. Well, it's not rocket science. But, you know, just making sure it's water sealed is the is the whole key to having a skylight. But like I say, this gives you the ability to have those things. You know, having a skylight makes a room look bigger. Just off the bat, makes it look bigger. It makes it look nicer. These are things to consider. I see the windows on this place. These windows don't look very big. They don't look very big at all. Don't see it as a problem. See it as an opportunity. Might want to go bigger than this on these windows. Because remember, when they were building housing projects, that's built by the government. And that meant that, well, at least back in the day before the government became so damn wasteful, they were bidded out to the lowest bidder. So whoever could build them a structure for the cheapest cost, taking care of the taxpayer's money, that's what they did. Today now, we got all these profiteers, all these Section 8 profiteers in here, and they're building all these damn townhouses and stuff. That really ain't townhouses, they're really raggedy. But in any case, like I say, this will be your opportunity to say, hey, this is not Section 8 housing. Have you ever seen Section 8 housing with a skylight? Have you ever seen Section 8 housing with five foot and eight, five foot and six foot windows? When's the last time you saw that? You know, like I say, there's, there's a lot of things that you can do and they're simple things, but things that you can do to upgrade what you have here. So if you got the structure and you're pretty sure it's sound and you got a crew to work on it and renovate it and more most importantly you have the money to follow through after you do that then i don't see any reason why you shouldn't based on what you've told me i don't see anything that you shouldn't i think you need to do a little more reconnaissance where you are check out the new stuff that's being built and just see how close to that you can come so that when people see the new stuff and then they see yours it'll automatically hit them that they see new, they see yours. It looks like the new stuff and they're, they're not prejudiced against you before they even get there. So it's already in their mind that 
hey, I at least got to do like I'm doing for these folk down the street. But other than that, I don't have a... Other than that, I think you're doing fine. I think you're doing fine. Yeah, I've actually I've actually located some um, granite and, and, and um, marble for pretty cheap. So I'm, um, I'm going to really try to bring some nice look instead of just going with carpet because carpet is rental no, property. No, no, no. It's not a good look. So do not do carpeting at all. Hardwood. The reason that you do not do yeah. carpeting is because you'll be replacing that every three to five years. And that's the reason that you don't do carpeting in a rental property. People got kids, especially if they got young kids. As soon as you see them walking in there with a baby or a toddler, you can kiss your damn carpets goodbye. Exactly. Brother, it's going to be Kool-Aid. It's going to be crayons. It's going to be tar. It's going to be mascara. Them kids are going to get in there and show the hell out. So I, I, for a rental property, I would never put carpeting in there. You are asking for trouble. The only reason I would put in carpeting is if, is if hardwood was not an option. But what you said before about the hardwood, that's the way you want to go. You want to go that way with it. If you're going to do carpeting, make sure you have somebody who can supply you with it on a regular basis. I'll just put it like that. Just make sure you can do that. But for me, whenever I've bought a property, the first thing that goes out is the carpeting. That's the first thing that goes out. And usually when they got carpeting on it, usually there's hardwood under it. Usually. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I can pay a guy. I don't guy, know why people do that. I can pay because they want to protect the... <sighs> okay. Things have changed. Usually what will be in those structures is those are not new structures that people do that in. Okay. New structures, the floor is concrete or tile or whatever. And they put carpeting on top of that. Older structures, it was hardwood. And then the person converted it. It was their house or whatever. They converted it into a rental property. Or in the old days, when they built these things, they were hardwood, and then they converted them into a rental property, but they had no intention of ever selling it. And they wanted to protect the hardwood. That's what you get carpeting on top of the hardwood for, is ostensibly to protect the hardwood. Because what they're concerned about is somebody, some jackass will move a piano in and make creases and streaks in the hardwood. Now, that's what they're concerned about. That is the advantage of putting carpeting on top of your hardwood is it prevents that from ever happening. But here's the problem. If you have to protect the hardwood, why are you putting in hardwood? You got a bunch of other options besides that. So I'm saying, I'm not saying to you in particular, I'm just saying to anybody who does that, why are you using hardwood then if you're actually just going to? If you want to protect the hardwood, you sh if the if the concern is the floor, you can put in basic tile or whatever, and be done with it. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? So carpeting is a wonderful thing, and I'm not telling you how to do your thing. If you want to do carpeting, man, hey, go to lumber liquidators or whatever, and go carpet the hell out. Go ahead and do that. Just be aware that. That is one that there are there's an upside to carpeting. Don't get me wrong. There is an upside. Okay. Some folk like it. If you can keep it clean and up to date and you know, it doesn't have a bunch of smells to it and stuff. If you can maintain it, which means you will have to come out and do inspections on a regular basis. If you can maintain it, carpeting is a great idea. If you ain't going to be going out there very often. And I mean, like if you're not going to show up, but once every couple of years, or if you're only going to show up when there's something wrong, you should think over the carpeting. You should think it over. Because I've been in places that had carpeting, but they would come through every three months or so. But if you're not planning on doing checking on your carpeting, that's something to think about. Because remember, you got tax in there and stuff, and all kinds of things can happen. So it's, it's really up to you. Just be aware. There's an upside. People like it. It's better than hardwood flooring. They got little kids, so they... Want the kids falling on carpets instead of hardwood? Okay. The bad side, that little bass is going to be throwing paint and Kool-Aid. And, you know, there's other things that could happen as well. But yeah, yeah. I, when I was uh, trying to flip some houses back in the day, I actually put some renters for some California investors. And within a week, I mean, some of the things I saw, it's just horror stories. People were, the things they did, it's just amazing. It's just amazing, some of these people. So... 
Well, that, that what they showed I mean, you, I, 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 what they demonstrated to you was why they have to rent and can't buy nothing. Yeah. If they did, it'll be somebody's used trailer, but they just demonstrated to you why they can't own anything. But you do. You don't want to make the place as nice as your house. You don't want to go all into that with it. But you do want to make sure that, you know, you take care of. I, I, I would definitely go upscale for what you're doing, man. I, I think you I think with buildings like that, based on everything you told me, I think you got a good foundation for it. And I think that uh, I think you should go for it, man. If you if you have the resources Thank financially, a hundred to one hundred fifty thousand dollars, I I would not walk. I would run. That's what I'm about to do. Uh, there's one process um, that you have to do once you get the title, and, and it's different. It varies from state to state, but I have to get a lawyer to do a, a, a what they call uh, clear the title up. It's called um, yeah, have to do a title search, uh, quiet yeah. title. Yeah, quiet. He has to do quiet title, yeah. and that clears up the cloudiness on it. And cloudy meaning the guy owned it. There was a mortgage. It went to the state. Then they sold it. So they, in order to clear that up, it's called quiet title. Yeah, but I mean, it's, may, I mean it's, it's referred to as a title search, okay? And what it is is he's going to track it back to see if anybody has a lien or any other interest. The purpose is to find out are there other interests in the property? Because the state is saying we took a procedure because this person was supposed to pay us taxes on it. And the state will supersede everybody, okay? Let's be very clear about that. The state will supersede everybody, including somebody with a lien. The problem is that once you clear the title and it's out of the state's hands, if somebody else has a lien, now he can pop back up again. Because the guy with the lien can't get the title if the state has the lien. But if you clear the lien, that guy, if you clear the title, the state's lien on the property, that other guy with a lien can now pop back up and come after you now. Because he still has an interest. Exactly. The state doesn't eliminate his interest the state supersedes his interest but it doesn't sever his interests oh. so that's the reason for getting the yeah. title searches you find out does somebody else have an interest in this property and if they do be prepared you know to pay them or whatever the case might be but uh yes that's that's very true usually i mean yeah but usually you do that on the front end to be totally honest Usually you do that before yeah, you go see the state. What I don't like is they give you a 20-day window, and then it's a list behind. People are on the list behind me. so it, 20 days is more than enough days, time. So. 20 days is more than enough time. A competent property attorney, a property search company, they can they will be able to get your answers within 72 hours. So the only thing is they'll slow you down is you. So as long as you go ahead and pay them, they'll do the title search. Make sure that there's nobody else involved. If there is, you will have to make a decision how you want to resolve that. In my case, I've had a few properties that did have other interests, mortgage companies, banks. But the property was enough that what I did was, usually what I would do in that situation was whoever was the previous property owner, I would get them to sign their property over to me. I get them to sign a deed, sign the property over to me first before I go to the state, the bank, or anybody else. So he signed over his you rights. You know what? He signed over his rights to me. Then I go and I pay the bank. And then lastly, I go and turn in all that paperwork to the state. And then the state what, what transfers this, this information to me. What, what makes this property really interesting is when I used to flip houses back in, you know, before the market crashed, the owner, the old owner of this property was a complete, like, racist white guy. You'd call him, he would give you these absorbent numbers, even though the property looked like it does now. Because I actually called him about this property, and he wanted $160,000 looking like it does in those pictures. And I told him he was crazy. So it just so happened that this property was on here. It's, it, and my du my old duplex that I actually sold to a California investor he was the middle guy for that. He wound up getting the property, and he wanted I wanted to buy it back. He wants $40,000, and, and the roof is falling in. I was like, no, I'll give you about three or $4,000. So, and now it's funny because both of these properties are on the tax list. 
So you know, you know what y'all to do? Situation right now. Y'all take those duplex properties there. You and your fellas ought to fix those things up. Y'all ought to take a group picture, like a yearbook picture, and send it to his old ass with your thumbs up and say, hey, <laughs> how's it hanging? Just wanted you to see the old place. Yeah, he's real greedy. Oh, I, I would do that in a heartbeat. I'd fix that thing up. I send it to his old racist ass. I I have a group picture with every black person. I bring in strangers off the street. Come up here and take this damn picture, and just send it to him and let him know we taking good care of it. We taking good care that, of your property. My oh, my mistake, my property. I really want to stick it to him. That's one of my main reasons, anyway, to really get the property as well. Because I remember how he was talking real crazy on the phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Section 8 this and Section... I'm like, nobody's going to give you a Section 8 voucher with, you know, the way it's looking now. So you, you, I would have to do the work, so I need to get the reward. He wasn't talking like that. So well, it's just ironic. What goes around comes around. And sometimes it comes right. around worse than it went around. So be careful, be careful who you mess over on your way to the top. That's all the people you got to cross on your way back down. And that's real talk. Yeah. Make sure you put so that link. Like make, sure, go yeah, make sure you put that link I'll, in the I'll group page the for minute. us, and uh, we want to hear about that. I'll let you have the last word. Black first, brother. Keep doing what you're doing. I saw the documentary in Atlanta. Loved it. I loved everything about it. Uh, I can't wait to get the DVDs and just I'm gonna buy a bunch of them, and just give them away. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting. To, I'm just ready to make it happen. Well, thank you very much. That's and what I'm keep... trying to do right now. Thank you very much, and do keep us updated on what you got going on there. That's going to be something to hear about. Let's go ahead and see if we can take a caller from 905. You're on live with the Black Channel. Just this is. Okay, that's what you have the number one on your keypad for. Reading is fundamental. It also seems to be colossal as well. Caller from 702. You're on live with the Black Channel. Just listening. Okay, you couldn't find the number one on your keypad either? I did. I, did. Uh, I don't uh, know if it's my you cell sound phone. sound like you've been doing Molly's. Okay. Uh, another group of individuals. The ADHD wing of black society is called in tonight. So, this is what we. You wonder why we don't have a code language? It's because we're still working on basic language, brothers and sisters. Now, in case you all are wondering, this is what we do here at the Black Channel. We've been talking about this for years. Nobody does it better. And the reason for that is because we don't have these kind of conversations in black society. You turn on the Home and Garden Channel, and they got, damn me, Real Estate Investing 101 going on there. The Property Brothers flip this house and all that stuff. I mean, they're sitting there showing you this stuff. Now, some of it is exaggerated, yes. But there are things you could learn about ideas, about what you can do with this stuff. If nothing else, the Property Brothers show you at least the building materials that are out there. They show you the building materials out there. They show you the appliances out there. At least you're able to see something like that. At least you can. At least you're able to see that. Because we as black people, we don't get out very much. We don't go and see a whole lot of things. We don't do that. How are you going to learn about stainless steel refrigerators and an open concept floor when your damn daddy has, has let some hood rat raise you in, 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 in Section 8 housing in, 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 in Chicago? How are you going to do that? How is that ever going to happen? Living, living in, in tenement housing and housing projects, your kids don't even know about these kind of things. So at the very least, they can watch a show like that and they can see, hey, take a look at some of this other stuff that's out there. You know, I, 
I, I, I, I'm not really a big fan of the bling thing. I'm really not. But let me tell you, one guy who does do it right is Rick Ross. Rick Ross in his songs, when he talks about that kind of stuff, he talks about the yacht club. He talks about, you know, the watches and the shoes. And I'm not even into consumerism like that. You all know that. That's not me. But what I am saying is that he's not talking about buying a damn pair of Air Jordans. He's at least talking about some aspirational stuff. Talking about checking the time on his bravado. Talking about, when he's talking about a Maybach, you know, now Mercedes is giving up on the idea of Maybach being its own individual thing. They're just making the Mercedes Maybach now under the Mercedes name. But I mean, that monster is still hideously expensive. Your daddy done brought home a 30-year-old car, put some wheels on it, and is acting like he's, like, like he's driving, uh, like he's driving a Bentley or a Ferrari. Dad is 30 years old. The rims are worth more than the car. But we styling, son, we styling. My dad's an idiot. That's what that is. No, you all don't waste your time with that. You go and you, at the very least, get learned about it. Get learned. I mean, I, and I wasn't even big into it like that. But when I saw the kind of money that those two guys were making, I said, hey, I got to watch their show a couple of times. And let me see what's really going on. I want to see what's really happening. And once I saw what they were doing, I was like, man, I got to get with these fellas that got. I got to get what they got. Because these guys are really making some things happen. They're taking just a regular room and at least showing what it can be. At least they're doing some things that, you know, would at least be able to, in, are actually feasible to increase the value of these properties. Now, you never know until you actually go off and try to sell something or rent something. You can never be sure, but let me tell you, make a damn convincing case. And too often, we as black folk, we don't do that. We're going into the 21st century where white folk are buying, you know, huge oversized appliances and they got kitchenette islands and all this stuff going on and open floor concepts and black folk are talking about, yeah, I'm going to go into real estate. We're going to put some paint on the walls and we're going to put in a ceiling fan and we're ready to break our arms, patting ourselves on the back. All you did was simply resurface the walls and put it in a ceiling fan and you are acting as if you remodeled the Taj Mahal. We have a 1915 mentality walking into 2015. And other people are a century ahead of us. We have to have vision. We have got to have vision. A man who lets his children grow up like that doesn't have vision. A man who lets his children grow with a hand and mouth existence, that doesn't have vision. And even if you don't know, that's not no damn excuse. Especially for you single mothers out there. Oh, yes, I didn't forget about you. Here comes the left hook. Because you've been, oh, he's beating up on the black men. Good. They love that. Nobody complains when I complain about, when I talk about black men and criticize them. Nobody complains. As soon as I say single mother, oh, wait a minute. Because one thing you don't hear from single mothers is the buck stops here. I've never seen a single mother say the buck stops here. If you are a single mother, if you are going to be laying up with some dude, he better be somebody who can actually build something. At least be laying up with a plumber. You know what makes hood rats so damn stupid? 
These hoes sit up here and lay up with a fella who's sitting on her couch doing nothing. At the very least, if you're gonna sit up here and hoe yourself, at least do it for somebody who's got the ability to build something. You should at least be hoeing for the electrician. If you're gonna be a hood rat, at least be a hood rat for a carpenter. At least be a hood rat for a contractor. At least be a hood rat for somebody who can actually do something and can actually put the mechanisms of power, wealth, and influence in the hands of your children. But y'all hoes, and I said it just the way I meant it. These hoes are jumping up here and laying up in bed with a dude who can't even change her tire. You can't even change the tire on her car, but he's laying up in your house. If you are going to do it, at least do it right. But white women ho too. White women do it for a dude who can build something. Asian women do it for a dude who can build something. Tiger Woods' mama didn't choose Earl Woods because she was bored. Tay Diggs' ex-wife didn't choose Tay Diggs because she was stupid. They grab a fella who's about something. If she's going to have somebody laying up on her, she's going to have somebody laying up on her who can produce and actually has a real skill. Some fella walking up and saying, hey, shouty, you cute, what your name is? Oh, let me have three babies by this nigga. And he's produced nothing. Can't show you nothing. At the there, there should not be. I'm gonna say it like it is tonight. Damn it! There shouldn't be a single empty structure in America that a black female does not have an interest in, or at least one degree of separation. When you go into certain cities and black females are 70% of the Section 8 recipients and 0% of the rental property owners, that's a damn problem. I'm a queen. I'm a queen. I'm a queen. Get your ass out there and be a damn queen of the rental structure. Why don't you be a damn queen of the Craigslist rental ads? How about that? Can you be a queen over there? Can you do that one? We sit up here and attach ourselves to people who leave us helpless along with them. They are helpless and then we let them make us helpless too. And you got females who go from having something to being helpless. If you're going to be a hoe, at least hoe up. Don't hoe down. If you're going to be somebody's hoe, at least be the hoe of a dude who is building something. That's just common damn sense. That is common damn sense. Y'all are sitting up here stressing yourselves to death. Try, trying to get five and six babies. Oh, damn it. Was I not supposed to say that? Oh, hell. Well, I said it. You're sitting up here and getting five and six babies trying to handcuff some dude who ain't worth a damn. And then you're sitting up and you, you, you're trying to handcuff him because you're scared that he got you in the bed and then he's going to be able to just get up and leave you. And so you spend your life sitting up here trying to use your vagina to handcuff people and it never works. 
and you're scared to death they're gonna get up and leave well damn it if he's gonna get up and leave at least make sure you get some equity out of the game at the very least it should not be a single black man in America with a tape measure and an ohm meter who ain't got at least two women on speed dial. At least two single mothers on speed dial. If you're gonna do it, at least, if, if you're gonna be a hoe, at least be a hoe for one of the black property brothers. Can you at least do that one? If you're gonna be a bastard baby making brood mare, at least be one for the guy who's going somewhere. But there shouldn't be a single fella out there with a caulk gun and a pipe wrench that you don't have his number. All over Facebook with dudes tatted up and, and, and every damn thing else. You're chasing children. You're not chasing men. And then when something goes bad, he disappears on you. Or he just leaves you or whatever. What the hell you got? At least get with a fellow who's about something. You know why Ivana Trump wasn't upset? Because when she was with Donald Trump, she learned. She learned things. Angelina Jolie, you know why she wasn't worried about breaking up with Billy Bob Thornton? Because she learned things. She learned Vincent McMahon, he's, his wife, Linda McMahon. You know why she's not worried about Vince trading her in for a new model? Because she has learned things. She has learned the business. She has learned how to be a CEO. She has learned how to tap into capital sources. You don't have a single black woman from the NBA who can say that. Not a single one. Evelyn Lozado working on what? Husband number three? She's not hoeing up. She's hoeing sideways. Ain't nobody set her up yet. Nobody has set her up nice yet. We make it a habit of not being able to at least gravitate to people who if it's gonna end, damn it, at least end on a high note. Because you ain't worried and stressing about somebody leaving you when you understand that you're leaving the relationship better than you came into it. It's only when you realize that you're leaving that damn thing worse than you came into it that now all of a sudden you're trying to figure out how you, you're out here busting out people's windows and acting a fool and, and, and baby mama drama and all that old garbage you're doing. You've never seen Kim Kardashian. Oh my God, did I really say it? You've never seen her sit up there and do that. Why? Because she leaves the relationship better than she walked into it with it. And we don't have enough black females who are saying, hey, you know what? Let me do better. Let me do better. I'm just jumping from one athlete to another. And it's not like these athletes are changing the world, by the way. Please, what do you own, control, and passing down? Can we be all the damn way real about this? Now, by the way, before anybody says it, no, I am not suggesting that you go out and be a hoe for somebody. I'm not suggesting you be the side piece. I'm not saying that. But can we just be totally honest? The reason why you have the term side piece is because there are so many of them. Can we just be honest? It's too many of y'all out there agreeing to be side pieces. And it would be different if you were agreeing to be the side piece who was elevating. If you were, at least we could look at you and say, that's a shame. We, no, we would look at you and say, well, that's a shame. 
when you're the side piece and you're losing, we don't say that's a shame. We say that's stupid. That's stupid. If you got kids, you get with a fellow who is doing something and you make sure that your kids learn that. If he's a mechanic, you put your kids with him and you tell him, Negro, we ain't doing nothing tonight if you don't start teaching my son how to fix on cars. If he's an electrician, you tell him, um, I'll be at your place, but you have to start t showing my son how to do what you do. If he's a plumber, you should be showing this boy how to do what you do. And if you got more than one kid, he's supposed to have all them boys learn the hell up. He's supposed to have every single one of them gamed up. If that boy is old enough to say plumber's wrench, he's supposed to be, he's old enough to use one. If he's old enough to pick up a pair of lock pliers, a pair of lock, lock ring pliers, he, he's old enough to start using them. If he's old enough to pick up a pair of vice grips, he's old enough to use them. That's what the Asians do. When their children are old enough to pick up a bowl of rice, they got them in their restaurant working for them. And you've all seen it. I'm in Louisiana and I've seen children working in these Chinese food restaurants. I know damn well you see it in New York, California, Texas, and D.C. I know you do. I ain't telling you what I think. I'm telling you what I know. If you're going to have kids, your priority as a parent is to make sure that your children are properly trained to survive and thrive for themselves in the real adult world. And if you are not doing that, you are guilty of parental malfeasance. Period. End of discussion. Bar none. You are guilty. You're guilty. And if you are not insisting on a man who does that, that makes you even worse. I've walked into convenience stores. Don't let it be a damn Arab convenience store. He's got everybody in his, he will hire, he will bring in his 10 year old nephew to work the cash register before he hires a black person. They train their kids early. They teach them young. Can't tell you how many roofing jobs that I've paid for and hear the white men show up in their pickup trucks and they got their sons or their nephews 15, 16 years old. And I'm seeing these boys skipping across my damn roofs. I'm like, man, you better slow your ass down. He's up there running across my roofs like he's on the run from the law. 15 years old. I'm talking about they'll be running with like five and six two by fours across their shoulders running carrying big buckets of tar and roofing nails and shingles walking down walking down the ladders you know like when you walk on a ladder you're usually facing the ladder i'm talking about these boys walk down the ladders with their backs to the ladder they walk down the ladder like they're walking down a flight of stairs I am not making this up. And I'm not talking about I've just seen it once. And that's the mess you'll see on YouTube. And I'm sitting there watching. And these young black kids are not out there doing that because ain't nobody showed them. These white children and these Latino children, these Asian children did not grow up wanting to be contractors or whatever. Their people put it in their hands because they said we live in a world that runs on damn money and you need this skill to make it. Otherwise, you are unarmed. Otherwise, you are defenseless. Now, I'm not sending you out in this world unarmed. 
You're gonna know something. You're gonna know something you can use. And after you have a skill that you can support yourself with, you can go off and go do whatever the hell you want. But you're not going out there unarmed. You're not going out there with just your bare hands. Meanwhile, in black society, everybody's got a pair of rims. Don't nobody have a tire shop. Everybody's got a bunch of speakers. Don't nobody make speakers. Forget installing speakers. If we're buying this many speakers, we need to be making them. We put, we were the people who first put televisions and made it popular to have televisions in the headrests on cars. Now they're sitting up here talking about a car is top of the line and they're selling them with the, with the TVs in the headrests now. With the Cadillac CT6 and the Mercedes and whatnot, they're selling them with the TVs in the headrests now. Why in the hell is it that we do not have a black company that makes LCDs? Why is it we don't have that? We got plenty of dusty Negroes and hood rats out there buying this stuff. We ain't making none. No wonder your kids, 90% of them are unemployed in Chicago and elsewhere. No wonder. When you cannot be bothered to do what is in your best interest, that is a death sentence. That's a death sentence. I started off tonight talking about Isaiah Washington and how he was using code words. He was using code speak. Because if he had said that he wanted to talk about white supremacy, CNN would never have invited him on. They never would have called Don Lemon. Don Lemon's turncoat ass never would have talked to, talked to uh, Isaiah Washington. Never would have let him on if Isaiah Washington had said the problem is white supremacy. Isaiah Washington played them the hell out. He got them to bring him on television and he started dropping bombs about white supremacy. And Don Lemon realized that he had been suckered into the trap because when he started talking about white supremacy, Don Lemon didn't want to ask any more questions about what does it mean by adapt. Once he realized that adapt means that white supremacy is on the march and we need to accept it and understand that that's the environment that we're in. Don didn't want to talk about adaptation anymore. He realized he had been took. He realized that he had an end run done on him. They're not used to black people being able to do that. We're not used to black people being smarter on these issues. We're not used to that. So when a black person actually did do it, people didn't know how to respond to it. We didn't know how to respond. We didn't know how to react. You had all kinds of people, supposedly educated people in black society, didn't know what to do about it. Didn't know what to do. We can't be this slow, people. We cannot be this slow. Not about our businesses, not about our economy, not about our code of conduct, not about our language, and not about societal warfare, which is what we are engaged in right now, whether you wish to be or not. We cannot be this damn slow about it. Everybody's got to be on this. Everybody. Everybody. Isaiah Washington may mess up and start tripping tomorrow morning. I don't know. He might do that. But right now, Isaiah Washington, and he was retweeting Neely Fuller, by the way. He was retweeting Neely Fuller's work. He was retweeting that. And I wonder how many people actually, I mean, first of all, how many people even saw it? First of all, how many of you even saw it? But he was retweeting Neely Fuller. He was retweeting the compensatory code system concept. I mean, it don't get no realer than that. It don't get no realer than that. But he's trying to speak in code to his people and his people are trying to say, no, Isaiah, don't speak in code. Tell the bad guys exactly what we're doing. 
tell them exactly where we're going and what we're doing because you see we don't consider it to be worth anything buying a pair of shoes isn't worth anything to us if we can't tell people because our, our self-esteem is so abysmally low if we don't tell them everything that we got all the money that we got everything we have we don't consider it to be worth anything so if we're not right up in the enemy's faces telling them, that's right, I'm going to be here like we're Mayweather Jr. or something, hyping a fight. Uh, if I'm going to be here tomorrow morning, 6 a.m., I'm going to be wearing my snakeskin gaiters. I'm even going to have one hand behind my back. I'm going to knock on your front door. I'm going to knock on your front door. I'm going to keep knocking on your front door because I know you're scared. And I'm going to wait till you come outside and then I'm going to hit you with a right and then hit you with another right. And I got my hand, other left hand behind my back, so I got to just hit you with another right. Right then, and I'm gonna hit you, and boy, you're gonna feel it. And then I'm gonna hit you with this left hook, and this left hook is gonna tag you, and then you're gonna go down. We want somebody to do that, like a carnival sideshow barker. That's what we want. We want somebody in black society to do that. And that is blowing your cover. What do we gain? from that we don't gain anything enough of people sitting up here demanding that we blow our own damn cover we need to make sure that we have a code and when we see black people first of all you all have to stop this idiocy this attention deficit disorder where you just read a headline and then you go sit down you read the headline and then you're passing it around that's garbage stop that mess actually take the time that if it was worth if it's worth you sharing it it's worth you reading it make sure that you ain't looking dumb because if i had just passed that article around like everybody else i would be promoting the same lie that everyone else is so that was why i had to make a whole video about it so i could expose the lie i could expose that yahoo and debbie emery started the lie and that the root picked it up and brought that lie like a, like a carrier of a virus brought the lie into the black body politic so that the lie could spread and people are passing that article around on the strength of the name of the root and assuming that the root is in our best interest and that is it and that's wrong that's wrong we have to actually start checking this stuff out. Because if you're passing around fraudulent and, 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 and erroneous material and libelous material, you are helping them because you are a part of that enemy apparatus. You're a part of that. You're helping them. So brothers and sisters, we have to understand that we need a code. And when people are trying to speak to you in code, we have to start accepting that. But this nonsense that we want everybody to declare themselves on our terms, that's terms, that's garbage. Some folks don't like some of the people that I retweet, some of the people I associate with or whatever. They don't like that. Because they don't understand what code is. They don't understand that we don't have a code and we need one. And if you actually were cultivating that, we wouldn't have this problem with Isaiah Washington today. We would have more black people who would be willing to speak up. But do you know the devastating effect that black people's inability to grasp a simple code and that we allow people like Yisha Callahan and 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 uh what's her name jamila lemieux and goldie taylor the fact that we allowed the three stooges to sit up here and hijack a critical pivotal example of code speak and debone it and disembowel it do you not realize that by our allowing them to take that and twist it and not having a sharp overwhelming forceful response do you know the effect that that will have on other black people in the media in hollywood with major media outlets do you know that that just told all of them it ain't worth it it ain't worth it because 
the folks are too dense to get code speak. They're too dense to get the subtlety of it. They're too dense. Now, even when this man said white supremacy, the folks didn't even listen to the interview. They just passed around an article that said, he's saying that you should bow down to white supremacy. No, he's saying that we should understand that he wants everybody. To, he's sounding a warning to everybody that we are in a system of white supremacy. And it's time for us to start using the proper tactics to confront it. But we didn't get it. We just passed around a headline started by a white writer at a racist suspect site, Yahoo. And then picked up by their bedwinch cartel. And then we just spread it. And so the next person, like a Lawrence Fishburne or, 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 or somebody like that, a Harold Lennox, they're, they're, they're going to be very reluctant. They're going to be very reluctant to publicly say the words white supremacy or speak out because our people fumbled the ball so hideously the last time. The last time that they needed to speak in a subtle way, our people fumbled the ball. And, and not only did we fumble the ball, when we did pick it back up, we ran towards our opponent's end goal and ran, tried to run a touchdown for them. That was what we did. It doesn't matter if Goldie Taylor was willing to carry the water of white supremacy. It doesn't matter if Yisha Callahan was willing to, set to, uh, to carry the water of white supremacy. It doesn't matter if Jamila Lemieux was willing to carry the water of white supremacy. It doesn't matter that Ebony Magazine, that's right, Ebony, I'm calling you out too because you were on Twitter responding to my post talking in support of Yisha Callahan and The Root. You were sitting up here spreading the lie too, so I'm calling you out also. Those individuals can agree to carry the water, but we as black society are supposed to derail that mess. Because their white benefactors are never going to give up on buying off black proxies to fight a proxy war against black people in our own society. They're creating a black civil proxy war. And they're never going to stop making those investments. It is our responsibility and our job as the people to call it out and reject it. Some random jackass on Facebook, don't worry about him. But when major media outlets start doing that, we're supposed to jump on that. We're supposed to jump on it. And let them know that you are not going to let this lie make its way around the world. The truth is going to beat you there. And every time we do that, don't you know we destroy them? We're Huffington Post. We decapitated them. Madame Noir, when they lied on Malcolm X and had a white writer come on their website, a white writer on a supposed black website talking about Malcolm X is bisexual. We decapitated them. Now with The Root. Everybody listening to me right now, you should be flooding The Root. Their Twitter, their Facebook, you should be flooding them. And saying you have a plagiarist and a liar working for you. And I didn't go into everything on Yisha Callahan. And I didn't do that because the white media likes to do certain little nasty things and whatnot. And I'm not going to sit up here and, 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 and do their dirty work for them. I'm not going to sit here and take their tactics and legitimize them. But every single person listening right now, you should be over there at the root. And we should be letting them know that, hey, we're calling you out on this mess. We should have it trending. We should have it trending. They, they want to have it trending tweet like Isaiah Washington. We should have it trending. Hate blacks like the root. Plagiarize like the root. That's how you stop those things. You want to see those people get put back in the line? That's how you stop it. 
but we're not going to be able to get very many spokespeople to speak up for us if we keep sitting up here allowing ourselves to be played for suckers every time we turn around and we, uh, we only have an attention span that can last longer than two seconds. That's not going to work, people. We need some adult intellect going on here. We need some adult intellect going on here. My hat's off to Isaiah Washington for having the guts to dare to go out there and put it all on the line like he's doing. That man deserves our respect. He, de he deserves our support. And on this issue, he deserves our vigorous defense. Because if we don't stand up for Isaiah Washington here, if we sit up here and allow the bed winches and the coons to sit up here and savage this man here, you can forget about anybody else standing up for us in the future. Forget about it. It's not going to happen because you're going to say, why don't these black celebrities and these black ball players speak up more for black issues? You've been saying it for decades. Isaiah Washington did it. And now it's our time to stand up for him. Because if we don't, all those people are going to say is hell. Why? How am I going to put myself out there for black folk? Black folk ain't going to put themselves out there for me. None of y'all going to put yourselves out there for me. If I go out there and speak up, speak up for black folk, hell, black folk are liable to sit up here and tell me that I'm wrong for speaking up for them. Those are the consequences. Those are the consequences. If we don't stand up here now, you see, we as black people do not cultivate an organization of people who will support us. We don't cultivate that. We don't do the work of, of, of supporting other people to speak for us. We don't do that. We sit up here and show people that it's detrimental. Hell, we might take you down if you speak for us. You're not going to get supporters that way. You get supporters when you show people that if they speak up for you, you got their back, front, sides, top, bottom, everything. That we will gather around you and support you, and we will not let individuals who have an anti-black agenda, because they're controlled by white corporate entities, we're not going to let them run wild on you. We are not going to let them come into black society and run wild on you. We're not going to let that happen. But when we show people that it doesn't pay to defend black people's interests, you, you just killed any potential spokespeople you would have. Because your ball players are saying, and that's why I don't speak up on black issues. Your rappers are saying, and that's why I don't speak up on black issues. Your black TV actors and your black movie actors are saying, and that's why I don't speak up on black issues. And the next time that we try to call them out, all they'll have to say is remember Isaiah Washington. If I speak up, y'all ain't going to support me. Yeah, we'll support you. You're going to support me like you supported Isaiah Washington. You're going to support me like that? You're going to support me the way you supported him? Is that the kind of support I'm going to get? We need a million Isaiah Washingtons. We need a million. And right now, we did a bunch of work to try to disarm the only one we got. We got one black man who was willing to say the words white supremacy. You ain't never going to get Kerry Washington to say that, people. You're never going to get Sidibe. Is this damn thing on? You are never going to get Sidibe to talk to you about white supremacy. You are never going to get Halle Berry's screwball schizo ass 
to talk about white supremacy. She's never going to do that. She'll talk about racism when she can't get the movie role she wants, but she, and you all can talk about, she talked about racism. She ain't going to go in on white supremacy. She's not going to do that. She's not going to do it. Will Smith is not going to talk about white supremacy. So when we got a soldier who is at least willing to do it, we need to be very speak in a very clear and unified voice as a people that we back this guy. We don't have to agree with everything he's saying, but we will not let you take him down for saying what he just said. We won't let you do that. And we won't let you gin up something else to take him down over either. We're going to deal with the issue at hand, but we're not going to let you get away with this anymore. Now, when we send a message like that, that is going to get people's attention. That is going to be a wake-up call. That will make the Goldie Taylors and the Jamila Lemuse and the Root and the Grio back down. That is how you make them do it. That is what will make their masters stop funding them when they realize that, oh, hell, this ain't working. The people are, see it for what it is and reject it. That is what will do it. But that's not going to happen when we sit up here and start doing their dirty work for them. Brothers and sisters, we need a code. We need a code of conduct. We need a code of language. We need a code of behavior. We need a code as a people. Because this week, we had somebody attempt to test us on a code. And let me tell you, I'm not going to say that we completely failed, but we did not pass with flying colors. That's for damn certain. The video is on YouTube under my channel, The Black Authority. You can go watch it there. It's called Adapting to White Supremacy. You want to share that and you want to go at the root. You want to go at Ebony. You want to let these people know that we are, we understand you lied. And in the case of Yisha Callahan, she outright plagiarized a bunch of things. So the white supremacist lied about what Isaiah Washington said. And then she goes and plagiarizes what the white supremacist says, copying paragraphs word for word. But we need to be on them. This is how you change the status quo. If you sit up here and even think about making a law that the gays even suspect could impact them, they are on you. Yahoo's front page has looked like a gay website because every they've got at the top on the scroller, on the crawlers, and, and down in the list. Everything is about Indiana and, oh, they have a law that may impact gays, a law that may impact gays. The gays get organized and get vocal, and everywhere you go, they let people know there's a spotlight on you for doing what you did. That's how they do it. They put a spotlight on you. They want people to know who their enemies are. Oh, yeah. And one other thing. One other thing. Oh, yeah. About this uh, religious freedom law that the gays have been upset about in Indiana and in Arkansas and in other states because other states have a law just like it. Do you all realize that the gays didn't go out there marching and saying that this will penalize gays and blacks and minorities? Did you notice that? Did anybody catch the fact that when they made those laws that the gays did not object and get on Yahoo and CNN and say that this law will affect gays and blacks and minorities and women. Did you notice that the gays didn't do that? Did you notice the gays didn't try to tie what was in their interest together with black folk? You notice they didn't go out there and say this law could discriminate against black people. Did you notice they didn't say that? They said that the issue is gay rights. 
They said that the issue is the gay agenda. Black folk damn disappeared. When it was time for gays to stand up for what they wanted, wasn't no black interest in the room. All the intersectionalists were left without a chair when the music stopped. Every time black folk come around, we sit up here and try to hitch our wagon to everybody else because we believe that we're so inconsequential that if we don't gather other people, nobody will give a damn about what we're talking about. And the only progress we made is when we started saying things that with black on the beginning of it. Black lives matter. Black first. Black empowerment. When we actually identify ourselves, things happen. The gays identify themselves and let you know this is not a black issue. This is a gay issue. This is for gay people. We don't know how this law is going to affect black folk, but we know that you're not going to make a law that affects us. And they didn't try to stand up for black folk. They didn't mention black people at all, did they? I want you to take notice of that. They didn't mention us at all. Ain't no gay folk on TV talking about us at all. Nobody is standing up for us at all and saying how this law could affect us. It's just how it could affect gays. They stand up for their interests. And they protect the people who stand up for their interests. They protect them. They don't let you go after them. They protect their spokespeople. That's what happens when you have a code of conduct. The reason that the police unions have more pull with the politicians than black folk do is because police unions have what? They have money and a code of conduct. They have an economy and a code of conduct. The code of conduct, I think we'll refer to it as the thin blue line. I'm just making up that off the top of my head, but I like that phrase, thin blue line. So, they let you know these are what's in our interests. This is in our interests. And we have money and a code of conduct. And the money is what we use. The code of conduct tells us what we're going to do and the money is what accomplishes the goals of the code of conduct. Black folks show up and try to figure out how we can de-black ourselves. And so we sent Isaiah Washington out there. We allowed him to go out there and we didn't have his back like we should have. We did not have his back like we should have had. We did not. And that's criminal. That we allow people to take what was clearly a 357 slug in the head of white supremacy and jump in the way of the bullet to save white supremacy. The fact that we allowed that to happen is disgraceful. It's disgraceful. It's a damn shame and an embarrassment. Now, we have a chance to redeem ourselves from this. And that's why I'm telling you that if you're out there listening to the sound of my voice and you listen to this broadcast later, the least you can do, I'm not even asking you to damn the marching and the protesting. The least we can do here is make these bastards famous. The least we can do is make them famous. So let's make sure that we let them know that you want to try to blow us up to distort things. You want to try to blow us up to lie about us. We're going to blow you up and tell the truth about you. That's what we're going to do. As black people, we don't do long-term strategic thinking. Isaiah Washington was talking in strategic talk. He was talking strategy on CNN, and black folk didn't get it. We allowed somebody else to tell us that, it, to, 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 to deflect from that 
and we totally missed it. That man was speaking in strategy. He was speaking in code. He was speaking strategically. He was speaking strategically. While that he was moving the ball, he was doing what the gays do. I'll, I'll, since you all need it spelled out for you, Isaiah Washington was doing what the gays do. That he wasn't just saying that black lives matter. He's saying that harassment matters. That you should not even be allowed to harass us. Enough of this black lives matter. That you're coming into contact with us for any reason. That that matters. He's saying that coming into contact with us for any illegitimate reason, that matters. He's moving that bar higher. He's moving it up. And we were supposed to see that and catch that and back his play. Because the next time we need somebody to speak up for us, you know what you're going to end up with. The next time that you need somebody to speak up on a black issue, you know what you're going to end up with. You're going to end up with Lamont Hill and Toure. That's what you're going to end up with. Because that's all you got left. That's all you got left. If you aren't willing to back the people who call out white supremacy, you're going to end up with people who will never call out white supremacy. Because that's all you got left. That's math. That's not even ideology anymore. That's just math. You won't support the people who will call out white supremacy. So you're just going to bunch of people who call out racism in some broad, vague, innocuous way. And nothing changes. Because anybody can avoid being fingered if you're going to be speaking broad generalities. If you're going to have somebody who's going to speak in specifics, speak in the damn specifics. And if you will not say that it is white people perpetrating racism against black people and that is a problem, that, then you're not going to fix nothing. It's not black police officers out there harassing black people like that. And it's not black police officers out there harassing white people. There are no white people out there in droves getting gunned down unarmed by black police. Those numbers are infinitesimal. Compared to the number of black people, men who are gunned down, unarmed, by white police officers. So clearly, the white segment of society has a agenda. And Isaiah Washington called it a white supremacist agenda. But if you aren't willing to back the guy who will say that, you're going to end up with a bunch of mealy mouth Negroes like Goldie Taylor and Melissa Harris Perry who would rather beat up on black men. Now, they will speak about black men in specifics. Yisha Callahan will go after black men, specifically black men. Goldie Taylor will go after black men. Melissa Harris Perry will go after black men. They won't go after white daddy. They're not going to do, they're not gonna do that. But if all you're going to support are the bed winches and, and, and the mealy mouth spineless coons, if that's all you're going to back, and the one person who does have your interest, you ain't going to back him. As a matter of fact, you're going to go against him. You can forget anybody standing up for you ever again. You can forget about it. And this concludes tonight's broadcast of the BlackChannel.net radio. I am your host, your brother, your humble servant, the Black Authority. And until next time, brothers and sisters from around the world, remember, black is the future and the future is uncompromising.